Believe it or not, there are only five games left in the regular season, and Carolina needs to make some adjustments to free up the offense. Is it doable? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. Welcome into Locked on Tar Heels, the only daily Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shea. Joining me as he does every Wednesday is the guy, Coach Tech Kilby, coming off a big win in his own team's game uh, as we record this show. We want to thank you for diving in with us here on Locked on Tar Heels. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Pack, Carolina is coming off another loss. This one at home to Miami on Monday night on Big Monday. Now the Tar Heels have lost four of five and all those good that goodwill and those good feelings you had coming out of the 20 point victory over Clemson on Saturday are suddenly diminished. And so here's what we got to do. In his post-game press conference, Coach Davis basically said, you got to figure out how to get Mondo the ball, even when teams are sagging. Why are teams sagging? Because no one's hitting from outside where Carolina went 5 of 31 on Monday. Why wait? till? So he said, we're going to be working to figure out what we can do over the course of this week. Why wait until Sunday to figure it out against NC State when you can join me and Pat Kilby today and we're going to tell you what Carolina needs to do. So, Pac, here's the question. If you struggle to shoot, and we know that that is the norm rather than the exception, right? Saturday, and as good as Carolina shot, that was more the exception rather than the rule. If you can't shoot that well, and so teams are sagging off of shooters and clogging the lane on Mondo, what on earth can you do? Well, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. That's why I asked it. Give me an answer. <laughs> Hey, it's and the, and the thing is, it's it's not an easy answer. Shooting makes not. everything a lot easier um, to me. And one of the things we did last year that I haven't seen us do as much this year is we pulled Armando to the perimeter and used him as a screener some. And then after getting the ball to change sides of the floor a couple times, he would go ahead and slip those screens and slide into the post and get a post up. I think that might get the defense moving a little bit more and and able to, you know, maybe free him up so we can get some easier post entries. Um, but at the same time, I would like to see us, you know, maybe not spend as much time in the offensive set on ball screens hmm. and actually start spacing the floor and running cutters through, opening up double gaps for our guards to be able to get downhill and force help or force – force the defense to adjust because we're getting to the rim. And I think if we can make some adjustments where our guards are getting to the rim and they're able to score uh, more freely and let be less reliant on the three-point line, then the defense is going to be forced to adjust to that, which would open up Armando. The catch-22 with that is we'd kind of have to go away from Armando to some extent in order to get them to adjust, if that makes sense. It does. Um, and I know I know we don't really want to do that, but at this point, you know, I think we've got to be willing to try it so that we can free him up to get him the basketball. Yeah, and and you saw some of that on in, in Monday's game when Norchad O'Meara had to go to the bench with those two fouls in the first half where it really kind of paved the way uh, quite, quite literally, I guess I would say for Caleb and RJ to get to the rim, which they essentially did at will at that point. And so the question becomes, how do you do that? Even when a player of Omir's caliber is on the floor. Um, for me, it, it felt like Carolina had a lot of good shots on Monday, but just weren't hitting them as, as kind of has been the case a lot this year. I said this on yesterday's show uh, for those of you who missed it, but my problem wasn't necessarily against Miami that Carolina didn't hit enough threes. It was that they took too many threes, right? Like, and, and I know on Saturday, once again, you took 33 and you hit 15 of them. And so in this game, you take 31 and you only make five at some point. Like, I know there's that thing that, and people are going to say this back, like, Hey, shooters got to shoot. 
right? I get that. And you got to shoot yourself out of a slump sometimes. But at some point, I feel like you got to recognize this is just what this team is. This is a team that is going to have some really good shooting days, but more often than not, they won't. And so at what point do you say, we are not going to take as many threes and we're going to rely on doing all the things you just talked about, Pat, creating spacing, crisper passing, not not purposeless offensive possessions, right? Um, and, and you even look at what Miami did. Miami only made one more three than Carolina did on Monday night. But you know what? They took 18 fewer threes to get there. If Carolina had cut down the number of threes they took and utilized more two-point baskets, in which they were making over 65% of them in that game, that, that changes the complexion of it immediately. And so I, I think everything you just said, combined with a different shot selection, all combines together to, to hopefully achieve what we're doing. Pack, I want to get your take on what I, what I said about um, shooting yourself into that or re- versus recognizing like, hey, our team just is going to have nights like this. And at some point, you got to find a different offensive way to attack. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, my example is, is the first half versus the second half of Miami. You know, Omir, he went to the bench with three fouls. Is that correct? Two in the first half. Two in the first. And to me – Never came back. Never came back in the first half. Never came back, and we feasted at the rim. I mean, I thought we were getting there. We were doing our thing. The second half, I know he's a really good player. He came back into the game, and that kind of changed things. But why did we stop attacking? You know, he he's in foul trouble. Make him foul you at the rim or make him not foul you at the rim, which gives you a path to the – you know, to the lane and, and able to go score. And I just thought we went away from it. And I think we have this mentality of settling uh, far too much. And just like you said, I think you nailed it on the head. You know, when shots aren't falling, you have to adjust. And you have to find other ways to score, with whether that's paint touches uh, to, to Baycott or attacking the rim, finding ways to get to the free throw line, which it should be noted – Up until the last few games, we've done a really nice job of getting to the free throw line. And it feels like we've kind of lost that a little bit. And that's really hurt us. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you nail it on the head. It's got to be, oh, shots aren't falling. All right, we've got to switch to attack mode. And then once you see the ball go through the net a few times, it's funny because shots kind of start falling after that. So, I think that's got to be a mentality switch for us. Yeah. Well, Carolina is going to have to figure out a way to make that mentality switch. We're going to talk more about that. And as we get into the next conversation, what I want to look at is this. At some point, you have to either make a decision to change your scheme to match the personnel you have or change your personnel to match the scheme. Where is Carolina at with that this season? We're going to talk about it in just a minute. But first... This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. We are at the midway point of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel FanDuel Sportsbook app. app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and three pointers drained. I've personally got Giannis on my fantasy team. And so I'm trying to look at that over every time on his prop four points scored. Plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on once again that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more so make every moment more with fanduel an official sports betting partner of the nba so pack I, i've kind of gotten into some interesting conversations over the past couple of days since the loss to miami and a big part of it is this C- coach davis 
has clearly found his personnel, the guys he wants to use. We've seen that in each of his first two seasons this far because he knows the scheme he wants to run, which is where you rely on on shooters around a big, including someone at the three and someone at the four. That worked very well. Last year, I know Leakey is not the most prolific shooter, but you had that at positions one, two, and four last year with RJ, Caleb, and Pete around the thing. And so kind of going back to the conversation we just had about Um, adjusting, making some of these offensive um, uh, changes to allow yourself to be in a better position. Because clearly the the things right now aren't working at an optimal efficiency level as you would hope. And so I know we've had the conversation a lot about, do you change the starting lineup or anything like that? But I feel like there comes a point where we either need to change the scheme or change the personnel. It seems like Coach Davis is undesiring of changing the personnel. That's fine. He's the head coach. That's his prerogative. But at some point with this group, is there, is there a, I mean, and here we are with again, five games left in the regular season. So it might be too little too late, but are there, is it time to consider some more scheme adjustments that don't rely on playing the way Carolina has been trying to play all year? Whew. That's another great but loaded question. You know, to me, um, I think you're I think you're spot on about Coach Davis. Um, he seems to be pretty strongly convicted about the scheme that he wants to run, and also the personnel he wants to run onto that floor. Um, to me, at this point in time, it's probably at this point in the season. It's it's too late to make major scheme adjustments. Um, sure, you can make a, a tweak here and there, and that's usually what's what's done in scouting reports, dependent upon matchups and opponents and things of that nature. What I think needs to change is personnel. The scheme that we run, let's just let's be blunt about it, is dependent upon our four man being able to score. That's why Brady was so good. And that's what made us effective down the stretch last year. And quite frankly, what made Brady so important to this team. And created that space for Mondo and created that space for RJ and Caleb to get to the rim, like you were talking about earlier. Absolutely. While still being unselfish. He was a great passer. And to me, um, you know, Nance just – and I listen, I love Nance. Um, Great guy. Seems like a great teammate and a great leader. He's not done enough. His playing hasn't shown enough for us to say that's the guy that's the fit for that scheme. I think we can all agree with that. Um, So to me, Jalen's been pretty efficient when he's been in. Uh, Puff has done some really nice things. And I know he didn't shoot the ball worth a darn against Miami, but even just outside of a one-game track record, I think he's done a lot. And so to me, I think – I think we'd just be better suited for a personnel change. Okay. Let's be honest at this point in time, what do we really have to lose? That's the thing because you, you've essentially already lost the NCAA tournament. And by that, I don't, I don't mean that it's out of the question or it's not going to happen. I just mean you are on the fringes of it. You are a bubble team. I mean, unless you go five and zero down the stretch and win the ACC tournament, you're probably not getting anywhere above that 8-9 game. You might be 8-9, 10, 11 if you get in. So so why not try stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and so it, I was kind of – I was thinking about it earlier today. You know that like that phrase, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? You know that phrase I'm talking about, Pat? Oh, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the way it popped into my head today, if a stretch four can't stretch the floor, are they really a stretch four? Like, and so at some point it's like that, that's not what Carolina's rolling with. And I know Pete's um, career three point percentage is good. Like really good. Again, less volume shooter than a lot of people you might look at, but I mean, if we're going to keep the scheme, which I think you are wise to say like, Hey, with five games less than the regular season, like it, that ship has sailed. And so it's about personnel adjustments now. Well, I, who who do you go to? Because like you said, Puff wasn't nailing shots. Like you look at that Miami game. He and Pete essentially shot the same 
number, you know, did the same thing shooting. Uh, you look at Jalen, who I, I said this on yesterday's show. I mean, he is this great shooter, but he's not made a three yet all season. He's going to, and I think he's going whether – uh, he gets there this year. I, th- I think of Kenny Williams, who famously made one three-pointer his entire freshman year, and it was in like the quarters of the ACC tournament, I believe. Um, and um, I mean, so maybe it's him, but is he still learning? Is he still getting into shape? It's just anybody you start to think about that could move into that role. Well, here's what I would argue. What do you do? Just argue. Let me hear it. To play the devil's advocate here. Jalen Washington is a Tar Heel for the next three years. Pete Nance's time is up in about a month. Are we losing that much by by putting Washington in for for Nance? I'd argue that we may gain some interesting uh, in in the moment and in preparation, in preparation for the future. future. Yep. Yeah, yep. And so, I, I mean, as a coach, my mind is kind of thinking those things through. You've got a senior, you've got a freshman. They both do the same things. Why not get the freshman more experience and preparation for the future? Um, why not? Answer it. Answer your own question. Why not? Well, why not is because, you know, Nance has done a good job of being a leader and he provide he does provide some senior and veteran leadership. Uh, but I actually tend, tend to lean towards do it uh, because of what the future holds for Jalen. And I think he's going to be a really special player. And I think he gives us more of the stretch that we need in our offense right now. So that's just my two cents. Uh, I like Puff in that role too, but I kind of like Puff coming off the bench for Leakey just because that's the role he's going to fill next year. So these are just my thoughts. Um, But I I would love to see Jalen in that role. Okay. I like it. I don't think Coach Davis is going to make the switch. Unless Pete – I mean, let's be honest – we could be in a real situation where it seems like something's up with Pete's back still. Um, I think that has played a big factor in his um, ability to play at the level he is used to playing this season. I, I, now I I know everyone's banged up. Everyone's near poor Mondo, like tweaking uh, something with his back on Monday, something happened with his left or like this dude, him is just, he's a walking bruise basically poor Armando. But um, I, I really legitimately think whatever issues Pete has had with his back this season are affecting him in a big way. Yeah. Well, you know, go before ahead. We, before we move on, I'll just yeah. I'll just end it with this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And I feel like that's kind of what we've done. We've beat our head against the wall with the same personnel and the same scheme. I'd just love to see us throw something different out there and just see how it works. See where it takes us. Because like we mentioned earlier, there's just not much to lose. Yeah. Well, uh, that lane is certainly going to be clogged on Sunday when Carolina goes to Raleigh because DJ Burns going to be hanging out in there, just ready to bang in the post with Mondo should be very interesting there. Well, friends, we are moving on to our new segment that we are, kind of unintentionally have found the past couple weeks and this is unpacking it with coach pack we're going to get into talking about some of how miami was defending carolina's ball screens on monday night and we'll do that in just a second all right we are going to move into our final segment of the show unpacking it with coach pack and it's this, it's funny, last week when we did this segment, we were talking uh, about ball screen coverage as well, de- defensive uh, ways to look at that, and we talked about drop coverage. Uh, interestingly, we're going, we're flipping to the other side of the pendulum this week, because what Miami did, particularly with Omir, and part of why I thought he was so, uh, played such a pivotal role in this game against Miami, is that... Uh, he would just show aggressively. And and so, Pac, what I would love for you to do is unpack for us uh, the way Miami was guarding ball screens and why this type of aggressive showing on ball screens is so t- difficult for guards to navigate. Uh, I think for a lot of people watching it, they're like, why, why can't they get around the big man? Why can't they move past him? Why can't mm-hmm. they navigate in other ways? And so, Pac Kilby... Let's unpack it. Well, first of all, props to Miami because 
I love the way they guarded ball screens. It was impressive, man. It was, and I would love that dude can move. But he absolutely can. Oh, holy cow! I would love to see us get to a point where we can guard ball screens like that. Why not? Is yeah. is Mondo too slow foot speed wise? I I think so. To okay. be honest with you, but I think Nance could do it. I was gonna say, what if you Jaylen switch and and Pete's the screener? I think he could absolutely. Jalen could do it. Yeah, heck, Puff sure. could do it. Yeah, anyway, absolutely, he could do it. So to me, you know, the way we've got to handle these, there's well, there's you know, there's a couple things that we can do to offset that. But what basically what they're doing on that hard hedge or when they show really aggressively, they're forcing our ball handler to go away from the basket. And that just slows everything down. It gives the defense time to recover. It pushes us out of our offense. We get in really, you know, basically pushed out. And we get we get in a bind. And then next thing you know, we're having to reset and get back into the flow. Just disrupts a lot. Um, so so to me, fact, would you would you actually explain what happens in this type of defending? So my man comes uh, to set uh, the screen, and I'm the defender. What is it that I'm doing? So you're getting literally your chest is parallel to the sideline. So you're straight up and down and you're extending out back towards half court, back towards half court, forcing that ball handler basically to go either through you or all the way around you or about face (laughs) or about face. And it just disrupts the flow of any ball screen. I, I just so wish we could get to the point where we could guard like that. But anyways, the ways you can offset it, you know, anytime your defender as a as a post player, if you you see your defender showing a hard hedge or showing aggressively, then you can slip to the basket for starters. And to me, but that's the screen even gets there. Is that what I'm trying to do? Right. Yeah. So if that, you know, you're coming to screen, you see, oh, my defender's about to show hard. They're going to get out there and be aggressive. You're slipping to the basket. Yeah. A great example of that, if I could, is Dame Lillard. He's so good at slipping those hard screens. Yes. Hard very much so. Yeah, very much so. And so uh, we can get those slips. I think that could it can help keep the defense honest. Hmm. But one of the things that I'd love to see us do is when Armando, like if we can just get our ball screens where Armando is slipping them, almost just make it a call, get him slipping them, and then our guards can get a quick – reversal to change sides of the floor then armando's posted up on the block the defender's coming from behind him so he's got a he's got a target available we can change sides of the floor and get a direct post entry off of that off of that and you know those are the things where we could really really improve but the ball sticks with our guards too much sometimes Mm. and they get caught up dribbling too much or trying to do too much, you know, by themselves. And particularly when people pressure us and push us out of our comfort zone a little bit. And so those are things that have to improve. And then the other thing is, you know, that we could do to kind of offset that is when the post defense is hedging so hard or they're showing aggressively, that leaves a lot of space open in that paint when you reject the ball screen. Mm -hmm. So, Essentially, you're playing one-on-one. So RJ and Caleb and DeMarco and Seth, if they can beat their guy off the dribble on the reject screen. The rim protector's gone. The rim protector's gone, exactly. So they have a free lane, play one-on-one, and you know their only job is beat the guy lined up in front of you, and you can get to the free throw line or you can shoot a layup. So if we could improve in some of those areas, I think we could have a lot more success against the ball screen. Interesting. And so why, I mean, you, you talked about the, the guards being too sticky with the ball. Um, it it feels like Seth in his limited minutes this year has done a good job of being unselfish with that. What do you think? uh, I mean, with RJ and Caleb, clearly more combo guards, clearly more score force guards, 
score first guards as opposed to somebody like an Ed Cota or a Kendall Marshall to use uh, famous Tar Heel true point guards. Do you think someone that is a more true point guard like a Seth Trimble or like some guys coming in the future, Simeon Wiltshire or Elliot Cadeau, who are very legit true point guards, do you think they would handle these better with either slipping the screen themselves or getting the big to slip and finding a way to get it to them? Like, do you, so the question, let me ask it this way. Does not having a true point guard hurt Carolina with this type of ball screen defense? Absolutely. It does. And honestly, Isaac, it hurts us in a lot of aspects. How else? Um, well, it just goes back to what I mentioned earlier. I don't think we have a true floor general. Hmm. You know, you look, you go look at like all these great Carolina teams that we've had the back to Roy Williams championships. It was Raymond Felton. It was Ty Lawson. And it should be noted, I mean, we all know Ty Lawson could put that ball in the basket <laughs> just as well as anybody, but he could also command the show when needed. Um, Kendall Marshall, Marcus Page, Joel Berry, the list goes on and on and on. We don't have that right now. And that's no disrespect to R.J. Davis yeah. and no disrespect to Caleb Love, no. but they're not those guys. It's they the are, makeup of the team. It's back yeah. to the personnel. Yeah, and their their score first, and we could just really use somebody that's about creating for others, about making sure we get a good shot every time down the floor, about making sure those little things happen like the ball not sticking and changing sides of the floor and ball reversals and post entries and just so many different things that, that those guards did for us in the past that we don't have right now. And I really think, you know, for Coach Davis, I know he's caught a lot of flack. But with some of these guards coming in that are true point guards, like you mentioned, that's going to help him tremendously. And it's going to help the Carolina basketball team as a whole just become better and more efficient offensively. Yeah. Interestingly, on the defensive, going back to what we had said earlier about, like you would love to see Carolina utilize – this hard show or hard hedge kind of coverage when we're defending ball screens. I, I was saying it improperly because I was talking about, uh, you know, us using a more fleet footed um, screen setter, but on the defensive side, you don't get to make those choices. And so of course the other team is going to run Mondo up there because he can't hedge, right? Like he doesn't have that foot speed. And so defensively, you don't really have the option of who it's going to be. It's you're at the will of whomever the, your opposition is using to ball screen action. And so I, I guess that's part of playing with that traditional or at least a little more uh, slower center is, is the inability to do that because an another action we haven't talked about that the, the guards could take, whomever the ball handler is, is if you can not even necessarily get all the way around um, the, the screen man's defender, like if you can kind of clip him a little bit, pick up a cheap foul on the big man and get him to the bench, that, that is another uh, attacking mechanism for this uh, screen action. Yeah, we and that's one thing we teach, and I'm sure that our staff teaches it as well. When you're coming off a ball screen, you're coming off low, you're attacking that defender's hip, essentially. That way they're – Because they've either got an ole or, or let you foul. Yeah. Exactly. You're attacking that outside hip with your shoulder – and they are either going to go with you or they're going to step in the way and it's going to be a block. So we, and we don't do that a lot though. We tend no. to let them, they let themselves get out. strung out. The, the they do. Yeah. yeah. We let them tell us what we're going to do and it needs to be the opposite. Well, friends, that has been Unpacking It with Pack. We have just lots of uh, ways to guard ball screens. We've seen Carolina uh, deal with or guard it in some different ways themselves, and uh, we'll keep watching for that. And obviously, we will have next week's segment of Unpacking It with Coach Pack coming at you. Well, great episode. Great to talk about. More stuff coming up on tomorrow's show. We're going to have some recruiting action. And then, of course, on Friday, we'll get you ready for that rematch with NC State. Should be a pretty calm environment. Not much going on there in Raleigh on Sunday. Carolina has to get a victory in that one. That's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. For Pat Kilby, I am Isaac Shade. Man, it has been good to be together. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow Pack at Coach underscore K23 or me at Isaac Shade. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the show, smash that like button, and leave comments. You can email the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. And for your next listen, make sure you check out Locked On College Basketball, the brand new show on the Locked On Network, where myself and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know from around the world of college basketball. Available on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. All right, folks, hope you have a great rest of the day. Want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace.